You want to say something, counselor? Uh, I would, but I'm paralyzed with fear. You got something to say to me, counselor? I thought I was going to be scary tonight, but then <laughs> when I came here, I didn't expect to see carnage. I tell you what, now this, this show, there's yeah. one word that springs to my mind when I think this show is going to be. Oh, canceled. no. What, you have what, any what, idea what that word might be? Mayhem? <laughs> no, counselor, no. It's going to be carnage. Oh, God. Oh, God, no. Not, not that. Anything but that. Bedlam, mayhem. I, I was prepared for any of those things. Carnage. So are you technically in blackface? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> that's, 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 I mean, can you do that in 2022? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's okay again. Oh, I guess it's I guess it's different if it's a mask, you know. Yeah, you know. Plus, it's not like a black person's face. I don't know, because I had an Obama mask at one point. Was that okay, or was that? Yeah, that's what I'm face? saying. Like, I know, I know for a fucking fact, there was a bunch of white people that had Obama masks. So yeah, like, is that acceptable or whatever? I'm pretty Does sure it's count? fine. Yeah. Okay. So I guess a mask is different than blackface. I suppose so. I wrote you a song, Paul. Oh, you did? Yeah. Serenade me. All right. I will then. Happy Halloween, you fucking piece of shit. Happy Halloween, I will kick you in the dick. Happy Halloween, you fucking piece of shit. Happy Halloween, I will kick you in the dick. Wow. Happy Halloween, motherfucker, yeah. Happy Halloween, I will suck that shit up now. Kill everybody on the motherfucking earth. Halloween is everything everybody knows, bitch. Damn. I I'm I don't even know what to say, TJ. I'm fucking it's pretty good. I'm bowled over. It's pretty good, right? Nobody's nobody's ever written a song for me, TJ. You know. I know. That? So here's what's going on underneath that shit, because I don't feel like wearing this mask the whole time. Oh Jesus Christ! What what are you what are you dressed as? What is this? Uh, I don't know. A red skull. I'm like low budget. Um, paint outside the lines, Darth Maul. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 I see it now. I wouldn't have guessed that, but yeah, yeah, yeah I see you know. it now. It's like, I don't care. Like Darth Maul on one of his off days when he doesn't feel like putting the makeup on, you know? Right, yeah. Unless that's canonically what his skin looks like, which I think it probably is, but eh. I We're going to go with it. The... Yeah, I think it is. Like, well, he, uh, I can't remember the name of his species, but yeah, he's he's got a species. The Badassians. Yeah, you could pick that species in some fucking Star Wars game I played. You could start a character that was that species. Zabrak. Yeah, there you go. That is it. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's true. I do have a hammer. I'm the um I'm the Pelosi guy. Oh my god. Yeah. Dude, there's only two people that had the audacity to make that joke. You and Donald Trump Jr. Yeah. Trump Jr. apparently like posted a picture of a pair of boxer <laughs> shorts and a hammer, and he was like, yeah. "I got my Paul Pelosi costume." It was ready. A, it was tidy whiteies though, which is and everybody's just like ever like you know, of course everybody shitting themselves with grief over it and talking about how like nobody would have stooped so low in the past, and I'm just they like, totally oh, would have though. Yeah, no, they, <laughs> I mean like yeah. those people who say that have no idea about like American history and how nasty our politics have pretty much always been. I know they they they're addicted to this time that never existed where there there was like all this civility. I remember politics. when everything used to be idyllic and people treated each other good? No, <laughs> not in this no. country. I don't know what you're talking about, bitch. Never existed. Maybe if it, if it did exist, it existed for like seven minutes. Yeah. All right. Well, what do you say we get started here, TJ? We got uh, we got a lot of spooky stuff to get through tonight, don't we? Uh huh. 
It's a lot the of blob. Spook. There's a spooktacular that's happening tonight. Fucking a right. Um. So yeah, my little part of this, I, I wanted to find like horror movies that were based on real events, but I wanted, I didn't want to pick the ones that everybody knows. Like some of them are obvious, like like uh, Amityville Horror or whatever. Yeah. Uh, the Conjuring, mm-hmm. that Ed Gein movie, the yeah. Dahmer movies or whatever. And like obviously, like, but there's there's a lot of these that you wouldn't know. Like I didn't know the blob was based on a real story. Did you? I have no, I didn't know. Yeah, I mean, both the blob. There was never a real blob, though. Yes, there was. Right? What? Yes, there was. Oh, yes, How there the fuck was. Is there a TJ? real damn blob? There wasn't a real blob. There was a real fucking blob, TJ. All right. Let's hear this shit. Both the 1958 and 1988 reboot or remake or whatever of the blob. Both good movies, by the yeah, way. Yeah, really both excellent, in my opinion. Both worth watching. I actually watched the 1988 blob last night. I watched that one quite a bit. I watched that one probably not yearly, but I don't know. Probably like every couple of years. Yeah, it had been a while for me. It'd probably been like five or ten years since I saw it last. Mm. So it was a it was it's fun. It's an it's it's a shorter movie. It's like, well, I'm shorter, I guess. Used to be the standard length for movies was about 90. Yeah. Minutes. Well, I mean, it's about yeah, it's like back when movies used to like realize they didn't need to overstay their welcome. Like I saw I don't mean to get it off track or whatever, but I saw uh, that movie <coughs> Terrifier 2, which was really good, but also yeah. like unusually long for a slasher movie. It was like yeah. two hours and 20 minutes or something. I'm like, is there really any need for this to be this fucking long? I think that's only unusually long to people from our generation because it is like not weird at all for movies to be over the two hour mark now. That's true. <clears throat> Hope you mention uh, I feel like you didn't give him his due in the serial killer episode, dude, inspired both Psycho and Silence of the Lambs. Who? And either they're talking about Ed Gein. Oh, you, right. I mean, yeah, you, you're going to be a happy camper, Rick Wallace, because we're going to talk about Ed Gein in particular during this episode. Cool. Well, let's uh, let's talk about the real blob, though. All right. Uh, you said there wasn't a blob, TJ. If, this, and you if, you're, if the joke is that this is just some fat guy or something, I'm going to be mad. No, 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 TJ. No, no, no. There's no joke. All right. This is true. It's based on a true story. All right. I gotcha. Uh, They're based on a real incident that happened in uh, Philadelphia in the year 1950. Okay. On September 26th, there were two officers on patrol, and they saw what they thought at the time was a parachute floating down from the sky. Uh, They drove to the woods and found the landing site, and they found something there, TJ. They found a little something-something at that okay. landing site. Um, Now, this is one of those things that it's based on the testimony of two people. I gotcha. And it's also gained kind of like a cult status in and of itself, so you might hear different versions of this. There's a lot of them floating around out there. Um, but Various accounts give what they found some different qualities. Uh, but there's a couple of things that are pretty uniform. It was about six feet in diameter. It was purple. It was shimmering because it was filled with strange crystals and it was giving off a purple mist. <laughs> Whoa. Sounds like the fucking blob to me, dude. I don't know about you. Sounds like the blob to me. Uh, Naturally, one of the police officers dipped his fucking hand in it. And uh, <laughs> yeah, because I would do that. You know, you see that something like that. You're like, you know what? Let me let's touch this. Yep. Uh, didn't eat his hand. Uh, just left kind of a greasy residue on his hand. Uh, he he described it as an odorless, sticky residue. Um. Hmm. Instead, it seemed to sense that it wasn't wanted there and dissolved into nothingness. Okay. Uh, and it supposedly left the grass underneath it unbent too which is weird. Like it didn't have any weight. Hmm. Um, so it was on the earth for about 25 minutes before it dissipated into nothingness. Uh, there were two more police officers called during that time and the FBI was called, uh, but the agents didn't arrive in time to witness anything. The other two cops testified to seeing the purple blob and watching it dissolve. So how um, many people in all saw this Four. Yeah. Four people, four, four police officers, uh, all all of them wrote reports on it, and they all say the same shit. Okay. 
<clears throat> this is the 1950s blob. Looks looks like um, raspberry jam. Yeah, there is a lot of scenes in it where it kind of looks like a like a, a fucked up Jello mold and stuff. It is a pretty scary movie monster for a 50s movie, though. Yeah, I mean, just in general, it's pretty scary. Just a big amorphous yeah. acid blob that not only eats everything that comes in contact with, but it just grows bigger. You know, yeah, I mean, I mean it grows eats. larger and larger as the movie progresses and shit. And uh, you know, actually, the the, the you know, despite the fact that the uh, remake is uh, very different, I think in terms of like um, you know, like the level, like the extremes that's willing to go to, because it's a very gory movie. Um, like some ex very extreme fucking uh, gore in that film. Like yep. people, you just see, you see people get fucking completely dissolved and shit. Yeah, um, there's and it's very, gore. very well uh, rendered and stuff too. I mean, it's like great special effects in both of uh, them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, both like very cutting edge of their time. You know, but uh, they they do follow a lot of the same plot points, including kind of having a, a very similar, um, final like showdown locations, I guess. Uh, both both of them kind of have the blob invade a movie theater towards the end of the movie, which is kind of a brilliant thing because, of course, if you're watching this film as it comes out, you're in a fucking movie theater. So right, and know. they and they shoot at least the 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 eighties one. They shoot it like it's coming out of the screen and shit. It yeah. looks great. And you know, like um, you're also I mean, like the blob is on the ceiling and you know in a crowded theater. I mean, you know, people in that movie theater probably like were like. I'm just, I know it's not up there, but I'm going to fucking just kind of like, okay, yeah, there's nothing up there. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like they had to have. I mean, I a few have. of them had to have for sure. I'd have done it. I'd there's like, also hey, a trope. Hey, quick check. There's a trope in this movie. I wanted to see if you can think of any other instances of it. And it's kind of a complex trope, which is weird that it appears in so many different places. Mm -hmm. The old man that lives in the woods that mm -hmm. sees a meteor fall in the woods mm -hmm. and he's the first one on the scene to mm -hmm. investigate it and dies mm -hmm. because of his investigation. Yep. So in killer, 80, killer clowns from outer space is not right. Well, killer that. clowns from outer space does it. The blob mm -hmm. does it. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, uh, I mean the Jordy Verrill creep show, yep. the creep show. Um, yeah, that's a great one. Uh, really, color out of space in general. I think, like the Lovecraft story, that might even be really the origin of it. I think it might be, yeah, for sure. Because that that the, the whole thing in that story is kind of like this Men in Black. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. They do they do do that Men in Black as well. Yeah, there is it's it is a weird it is a weirdly specific trope that does seem to recur. There's also another trope that was pioneered by the original Blob, which is um, the kids are the only ones who know what's really going on, and all the adults are fucking stupid. Oh my god! And that one just like, yeah, that's, that's pretty, like, yeah, you could such probably a horror you, mainstay at this point, you know, especially eighties horror, eighties and nineties horror. Like pretty much every movie is that. You know, I think every got, slasher I think, uh, is that. Killer clowns from outer space. Uh, you know, I hate to bring it back to that again, but like that movie, I think with its skeptical sheriff, almost like I think was parodying that because they made him so over the top skeptical that he would deny like ridiculous amounts of evidence that the, that the town was under attack by killer clowns and just like ah you take me for a damn fool literally the lines are like ringing off the hook it's like whole town's in on it you know it's like Dude, he doesn't even Christ. he doesn't even believe it when the clown comes to his office he's like all right you punk kids i i'll give you this that's a good costume but you're all <laughs> going to jail you know <laughs> no he's so fucking you know, it's just so over the top, ridiculous. Uh, and but I think the trope is still used to this day, not as much. But uh, I think the Blob was the first movie to really do that. And uh, you might be right. I can't. I can't think of an earlier example. Um, it might not be the very first, but it's definitely a super early precursor. Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, of course, this story was reported locally, and that's where we get it from today. Newspaper clippings and the uh, police reports and stuff that are a matter of public record. Hmm. Um, they uh, it got picked up by the national press uh, sort of as a joke. It was treated like a joke. Uh, nobody really believed these police officers. Yeah. Um, and nobody treated it seriously at the time. Well, I mean, you know, if it's kind of like the, the thing where... You know, like what's more likely that these four guys are either lying or right. you know, didn't really understand they, what they they're saw all, or they're, 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 or you have yeah. to totally just change your view of all of reality based on what they've told you. And it's pretty like much. most people are not going to be like, yeah, I now accept that there's like crazy purple alien shit. 
you know, <laughs> uh, the Air Force or well, the FBI that that came asked the Air Force to investigate the incident. And the Air Force was like, nah, yeah, <laughs> not really. Nah, yeah. We're not we're, we're, we're not going to do it. They declined. I mean, well, I mean, like, it, to be fair, you know, like if they'd done it, like, it, it, you know, someone somewhere would have been like, what the fuck is this? You guys took this seriously? Like, come on. Yeah. I mean, it is pretty fucking uh, suspicious that it just like evaporated, leaving no trace of itself. Right. You know, and like, oh, and then it magically disappeared and left not a, it didn't even bend the grass, you know? Yeah. That's <laughs> like a bunch of guys going like, we done saw Bigfoot, but he ran off, you know? <laughs> you know? He didn't even leave any footprints or anything, you know. <laughs> he just. But uh, what if they? What if they did see something? What if they did yeah. see something, TJ? What if they're not lying? What if that was just like a precursor probe for the blob invasion that's coming to kill us all? Could be. Nobody knows, TJ. Nobody knows. I mean, it really could be. I mean, you know, like four guys. I mean, like there's not really a very compelling reason I can think of for four cops to just be like, you know, guys, let's make up this fucking, you know whack a doodle fucking story about this like crazy purple crystalline you know blob shit that we just that just came to earth and then vanished yep like let's just let's just do that for fucking attention i guess you know so i mean it's yep. like there's not a, there's not really a strong motive there but uh you know it is still more likely than, than you know the alternative Somebody dosed him with acid as a prank. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like that could be the case. I mean, you don't really necessarily have, I mean, not, everyone's not going to have the same reaction to the acid. <laughs> like, yeah, oh, man, well, we maybe, all maybe they all ate like at the same suggestion. diner that had ergot on the bread or some shit, you know? Oh, yeah. That's um, true. So somebody in the chat earlier brought up uh, Ed Gein. Mm hmm. Which, by the way, like if you, there are only a few pictures of Ed Gein, but on, in all of them, you can look at. I don't know if it's like confirmation bias or whatever, but he just looks like a dude that w it would be completely psychopathic. Um, um, it's not confirmation bias. You could show this to someone who'd never even heard of Ed Gein, and they'd be like, "Who the fuck is that terrifying person? <laughs> yeah, who's the axe murderer? You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like you can literally see like." veins bulging out of his neck you know i mean it's like come on yeah he, he's not he's not a friendly guy he's got the ultimate thousand yard stare just empty dead black eyes just yeah um, plus a picture like literally a picture is being taken of him and he's like he's not trying to pose for it in any way you know he's just like looking yeah. off to the like eh, looking off to his next victim <laughs> So for those of you that don't know, a quick recap of Ed Gein uh, and his crimes. Uh, so police entered his Plainfield, Wisconsin home in November of 1957. They were investigating the disappearance of a local woman. Um, and he was seen with her. He was the last person to be seen with her. Uh, when the police walked in, they walked straight into a house of horrors. No joke. Um, they found the woman they were looking for uh, dead, decapitated, hung up from her ankles so that all the blood could run out of her. Um, like, like you would do like a pig. That's how they do pigs. They string them up by their legs and cut their throats. Like, yeah, really they let deep. the circulatory system pump the blood out. Yeah. And, and, and then gravity, it once that stops, gravity takes care of the rest, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. <laughs> uh, but they also found a number of shocking grisly objects that were crafted by Ed himself. Uh, they found skulls. In fact, his bed had, uh, human skulls on it, on the bedposts. Had a lampshade made of human skin, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he had human organs uh, that were um, dried and sewn into various implements. Uh, so really, you, this guy's not all that scary. He's just into, like, arts and crafts. I mean, yeah, extreme arts and crafts. <laughs> yeah, you know, well. And extreme I mean, DIY, you know. Right, you know, I mean, look, if this guy was doing, if this guy was hunting buffalo and, you know, putting their hides up, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be complaining. So, you know, let's not be speciesist here. Yep. Um. His ultimate goal, as he later explained to police, was to make a skin suit yeah, uh, in order to quasi-resurrect his dead mother, mm -hmm. which he was completely and utterly obsessed with. It was part of his uh, pathology was... Yeah, bringing his mama back. Right, this ultimate goal of bringing his mother back. And so just saying those words, you can probably uh, think of a few movies that Gein has... Uh, directly influenced um yeah there's there's a few obvious ones i think 
probably uh, the earliest obvious influence. Psycho, yeah. Psycho uh, from 1960. <laughs> it, it's really credited as the first piece of media that was inspired by Ed Games, Ed Gein's uh, crimes, uh, based on a book by this dude here named Robert Block. Um, yeah. Psycho he was wrote published. Some, he wrote something else too. I can't remember what it was, but yeah, I can't remember. Uh, I can I could find out for you, or you could. I'll look it up real quick. Let's see what his other famous book is. I feel like he has at least one other one that was like a big, maybe two. I can't remember though. Um, so the book Psycho, published in '59, um, and Hitchcock's movie adaptation came short on its heels, right after it. Um, at the time of Gein's arrest, Block was living 35 miles away from where the crimes took place in a town called Awayawega. Um, I, just, I, I don't know if I, uh, I don't know if I believe this part or not, or if this is just like apocryphal, like Block trying to make you know the mystique be more. But he claims that when he wrote the book. He wasn't even aware of the Gein case, like the details of it. Um, he says he began writing with the notion that a man next door may be a monster, unsuspected even in the gossip-ridden microcosm of small-town life. That's a quote. Mm. <laughs> um, there, there's a, a review of the book by a woman named Paula Garan. Um, uh when real deal uh, details of Gein's case was finally released, Block said he was surprised to discover how closely Norman Bates resembled Gein in both crimes and motivations. Um, and he inserted a line in later editions of the book uh, to create a parallel. So, you know, that that's the question I have is like, is that, did he just happen to living 30 miles away? He just happened to write a novel that really, I mean, in um, plot echoes Gein. You know, it's kind of hard. It's It does kind of strain credulity to think that he was just totally ignorant to this very famous crime that happened so close to where he lived. And then he happened to write a book that's very similar to it. But I also don't see why, what he would gain by, <laughs> what he would gain by, uh, <laughs> by feigning, you know, like he hadn't heard of it. And I do know, that, like, you know, there's there's times when shit just permeates the zeitgeist, you know? So, yeah. I mean, like, it could have just been, like, you know, the the sort of, like, tropes and stuff that people talk about these kind of killers are about might have, like, filtered into his brain. But it seems to me like he probably fucking heard at least something about this fucking case. Maybe he didn't realize how much he was emulating it, but, like, it feels like he had to have heard of it. But maybe he didn't. I don't know. Uh, of course, this is a piece of shit. Yes. Uh, Hitchcock's film adaptation of that book, Psycho, uh, probably like one of the most beloved classic horror movies. It's number one on a lot of stodgy horror lists. And sure, um, it's mentioned and referenced in so many other works. That I mean, it's, it's one of these movies that uh, people who do not like horror movies will make an exception for. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Well, because it's a Hitchcock movie, so it's just it's right. shot brilliantly and it's paced brilliantly. So it's brilliant. like it's it's a uh, you know it has enough like film snob sort of acumen that people who are like you know usually poo poo the horror genre even will be like, well, Psycho is a, a good example of the genre or whatever, you know. Yeah, but th not this one though. This is a Gus Van Zandt shot for shot remake with the weirdly weirdly cast Vince Vaughn. Yeah, it's as awful. Norman Bates. Um, it, it's, it's one, it, one of these, one of two movies that I can think of that both of them are guilty of taking like a seminal work by a seminal director and doing these horribly ill-conceived modern shot for shot remakes. So there's this and there's, uh, the omen. Yeah. That's a really, no, that's another weird one. I mean, I remember being in the movie theater watching that omen remake and being like, is this shot for shot? Because it seems like it is. It is. <laughs> and it's just like, oh my There's God. There's a couple of scenes in it that differ, but all of the memorable scenes from the original are completely recreated. And it's just like, why would you, why does this need to be done? Like, we want to see your, like, you know, paint by numbers interpretation, quote unquote, of this fucking material. Like, fuck off. It's such a weird thing to do. Yeah. 
So this movie, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this movie, TJ. If you have, does not look familiar. I think you would like this movie. Um, this is definitely way closer to the Ed Gein story. This is a movie called Deranged from 1974. Mm. Um, it's been a favorite of mine for a while. Just a hokey, schlocky, super violent, gross out. You know, it's got those nice 70s blood effects and squirt and blood and brains yeah. and all that bullshit. The 70s were a fucking hell of a time for horror movies, for yes. sure. <clears throat> the 70s and the 80s, man. Yeah, um, I agree. This is just like such a, a blood spattered, weird age. <laughs> yep. Um, so Deranged is a 1974 Canadian American horror film loosely based on the life of Ed Gein. Uh, follows this uh, character, Ezra Cobb, who is a middle aged man in a rural Midwestern community who begins a string of murders and grave robberies after his mother death, mother's death. That's the other thing about Gein I didn't mention was that a lot of the body parts that he got were he would just go dig up people's corpses and shit. Mm hmm. Um, a lot of people, I think, assume that he filled his house with furniture that was like from people he killed, but he, he actually exhumed way more bodies than he created. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot easier. Yeah. Um, so just like Gein, this character's mother is extremely religious, uh, raise him, raises him to be a misogynist. Very domineering, too. Yes. Uh, after her death, he embarks on a string of serial murders and grave robberies. Um, story of Deranged also follows very similar beats to uh, that of Gein's life and his eventual capture. Cobb's fascination with the killing of a waitress named Mary Ransom mirrors Gein's murder of tavern owner Mary Hogan. Um, yeah, I didn't even change the first name. Nope. Uh, Cobb's treatment of Sally May's body in Deranged also follows close, closely with uh, Gein's treatment of hardware store owner Bernice Warden. So they, you know, it's just, it's almost like a Gein, like they made a Gein movie, but it probably would have been looked at at the time as distasteful to actually name a movie Gein. Right. So they just like kind of, you know. Right. So they made their own little through like a little very thin patina of fiction over it. And uh, there you go. <laughs> um. So yeah, here's a here's a famous scene from it where he's scooping out his mother's brains, he, like he's preserving his mother's corpse. And oh, yeah, uh, you can't let it. You can't, you know, you can't let her go to waste. You know, no. <laughs> you got to make sure mommy stays around somehow. But yeah, uh, you know, I, specifically to you because I think it I think it uh, meets your taste. So I think you should find it and check it out. I think you'd dig it. I mean, it seems like my kind of flick. I love these 70s horror movies. I love the first thing I th I thought when you said about the the 70s horror was just like how they they made the blood so fucking red in those movies. Like as far as they were concerned, yeah. blood is like Crayola red, you know. And yeah. uh, and then you showed a scene your last slide, you know, you had that blood on his hands and it's just that like very 70s red blood. Yeah, it's like uh it's like he dipped his hand in concentrated fruit punch. Right. You know, and it's just like, that's not what blood looks like, but it is what blood looked like in a shit ton of movies in the fucking 70s. And I guess the 80s, too. Yeah. Uh, but, the uh, 80s got a little better. They did make the yeah. blood a little bit more realistic by by the 80s. But like you still saw this red shit sometimes. <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, I think the blood looks best uh, in black and white. And they oh, would yeah. use chocolate syrup like Psycho was one of the movies to pioneer the use of blood like that like tons of blood in a movie they use chocolate syrup to do it and it looks great yeah it really does have like it looks exactly like blood it's a lot easier with that color palette well that lack of color palette i guess uh the only the only way that this movie differs from uh ed gein's story is that they add in a layer of necrophilia to it and ed gein didn't commit necrophilia he wasn't into that he loved yeah so, he loved dead bodies but he never fucked one so yep at least uh, not according yeah. to him. Maybe he was lying, you know. Maybe, but yeah. <laughs> He's like, no, never... I never did that. <laughs> That's the one thing I never did. So yeah. Uh check it out if you're interested. There's also, I didn't pull anything from it, but there's also like a a 90s movie called Gein. Uh, that's pretty good. The guy that plays that fucking dork in um Guardians of the Galaxy that whistles and an arrow goes around. 
Yeah, I don't. I don't know his name. Uh, I don't know, remember his name either. He was on he Walking Dead Gein. too, but yeah, he plays um he plays Ed Gein in that movie. Yeah, he plays Gein, and uh, it's it's decent. I don't know. Um, I, I actually like uh, Deranged a little better, but yeah, uh, um, I, I think the Gein movie is pretty good, but it is a uh, it's like kind of oddly restrained. And almost, kind of, I mean, I guess you could say it, it does like humanize Ed Gein a little bit more than some of the other films do. Yeah, but uh, you know, and then there's a, uh, a more recent movie too. I think it's 2003 or four. There was one called the uh, the Plains Plains View Monster Ed Gein. I never saw um, that one. And I've seen it too, and it sucks. So okay. definitely, if you're <laughs> if you're looking for a movie about Ed Gein, if you want over the top and crazy, watch Derange. If you want kind of like subdued and uh, not trying to sensationalize watch Gein and pretty much nothing else well you can watch Psycho but it's way more loose yep uh, but Gein uh, inspired even more movies of course uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 1974 another seminal work of um, this is one that when they try to put it out they tried to make it seem they try to make it t they try to tell you like yeah that this really happened like this te the Texas Chainsaw like in its current in its form as presented in the film is like yeah this is true events it's not, of course, but uh, Michael Rooker was also in Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. Yeah. Oh, that's that interesting. Be, must be the guy's name we're thinking of. So uh, Toby Hooper's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, he and Kim Hankel modeled the character of Le Leatherface here after Ed Gein. Um, but it's it, it's interesting because he's almost the opposite of some of the other portrayals of Ed Gein. He, even in, even in uh, Deranged, you know, Ed Gein is able to uh, have two faces, you know, the crazy face and the public face. And uh, the same goes for like, um, you know, uh, Norman Bates. He's, he, he, I mean, Nor Norman Bates grip on sanity is tenuous. And so is Ed Gein's. Um, but you know, like Leatherface is just completely fucking gone. You know, he's, he's nothing but like death lust. Um, it, who knows what his ultimate goal is, or if you could even glean such a thing. Um, but a lot of the little details about him, including wearing the woman's skin suit, which is, that's his mask. Um, I didn't know that when I was a kid, before I'd seen this movie, I'd seen a bunch of pictures of Leatherface and I didn't know it was like a woman that he'd skinned. Yeah. Um, I mean, Leatherface is pretty cool. I mean, he, uh, he's, uh, it's kind of unusual cause, uh, I guess that he's maybe it's kind of like insinuating he's like maybe like mentally handicapped or whatever. <laughs> so that's an interesting fucking angle. I guess kind of Jason is too, though. Yeah. So maybe there's like something to be said there about like, I don't know, fear of, uh, of, uh, you know, I don't know what the fucking PC term is these days, but, you know, mentally handicapped or. Yeah. Fear um, of fear of the absolutely like where all humanity has been stripped from them and they're nothing but like fucking kill lust, you know? Right. It's like, I don't know. <laughs> it's probably not like that. There's many people be reasoned, to that point, but they can't be reasoned with. I mean, yeah, you can see why that's scary, you know, and they can't be oh, reasoned yeah. with. They can't be tricked really. Be, well, I mean, like they, I guess they can be tricked, but they can't be reasoned with. Um, they, they, you have nothing in common with them. There's no way to manipulate them away from their goal because you don't know what's going through their head in the first place. Yeah, just no, and the only thing no they really want is to like just you know hurt you, kill you, chop you up, make you suffer in whatever ways they want. And there's really so, no, there's really nothing else you can offer them that's going to top that thrill in their mind. So there's no there's no ability. There's not gonna you're not gonna get their empathy. You're not gonna fucking you know elicit sympathy from them or anything. Yeah. Um. So Leatherface uh, demonstrates a history of wearing women's clothes, mutilating bodies, making masks and uh, other garments out of human skin. Um, here's another picture of him here. What a happy boy. Uh, Kim Hinkle uh, closely studied Gein when writing the screenplay for this movie. Uh, used a lot of the more gruesome details of his crimes as inspiration uh, for this character, Leatherface. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is the first film to take inspiration from Ed Gein without focusing on his relationship with his mother. Uh, instead, uh, instead uh, shifts the spotlight to his fascination just with skin and mutilating bodies. Um, though Leatherface is shown to dress up in women's clothing, this detail isn't related to his mother in any way. Right, or at least not 
in any way that's like explained or gone into like right it's, it's not it's, it's it's a way to even like really more dehumanize him because it's like you know that mother the relationship with his mother which also is another thing that you know, that jason has oddly enough but so i guess you could even say maybe there's like a little bit of ed gein in in like the jason um mythology maybe uh, yeah probably not consciously but it's it's kind of there that weird like uh overbearing mother son kind of thing i mean but, yeah, i mean I, like I, I, I wouldn't be shocked. Uh, it definitely. It's kind, of, it's kind of interesting that like, how, they would take that away from Leatherface because it's like that one little vestige of like human understanding that you have with like a character with a, a person like Ed Gein. And it's like, right. that's gone. Now all that's left is just like the weirdness and the monstrosity. And like that one little like sort of inroad of humanity has been like stripped away from you. So now he's just a monster. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, pretty interesting. Another movie inspired by Gein, uh, Silence of the Lambs. Hmm. Um, not necessarily the main character of Hannibal Lecter, but the serial killer backdrop character, James Gum. Um, so, uh, Jonathan Demi directs this movie. One of the one of the uh, best best written and best paced movies ever made, in my opinion. Like I'll go to those for that. horror films that transcends. It those doesn't who even have feel like a horror film. The genre. Yeah, I mean, it really. I mean, it definitely it does is, its though. points, but like, I don't, I don't think of Silence of the Lambs as a horror film. I think of it as like a, like a dark investigative drama, you know, which is what it yeah. is. But what what happens is uh, when they make movies like this and they don't want to call it horror or have it be thought of as horror, they'll use the word, um, uh, you know, it's a thriller. <laughs> a thriller yeah i mean yeah, it, this is a suspense thriller i think i would call this a thriller or a suspense thriller a crime thriller before i called it a horror movie um but it it certainly is a horror movie i mean there's definitely if there's, if it's not a horror movie it's a movie that borrows very heavily from the horror genre <laughs> so yes. i mean there's um, like death mutilation i mean like it's just so it's on such a other level i think that it's almost like wow this is transcendent yeah this is I just agree. like a masterpiece. I mean, there's it, like, if you enjoy very... like good detail oriented filmmaking, you owe it to yourself to watch this movie with a critical eye because it's just so well written and well conceived. Um, one of the things that TJ and I talk about a lot when we talk about this movie is how every side character in this film has a reason to be there and has a moment to shine. Yeah. If they're, if their character is in the movie, I don't care if it's a character that's in a that like is a background character in a scene. They give that character some sort of moment or thing that tells you something about them. Like anybody There's a that character has a line that literally it doesn't even have to have a line. There's a character that literally just sits in a car that you get to know something about them. Yeah, that's true. It's just like, yeah, he detests physical labor. You know, and he's just kind of sitting there in the car, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay. <laughs> I mean, we know something about this guy's fucking bodyguard slash muscle slash thug or whatever the fuck just because of that little throwaway line you know and it yeah. every so so everything in there adds to the i mean like in the scientists that she talks to that are just obsessed with like the the moths and stuff i mean like everybody's got like some sort of character moment even all if they're the only cops, on screen like for a hick, second the hick cops she deals with and all of the little like tertiary characters that she's getting closer and closer to Jane gum and the parents of uh, the girls that have been killed by this, uh, this serial killer. And, you know, it just everybody it, like, there's no throwaway characters and nobody that's just there because they had to put another body across from the star. Yeah. No one's just a warm body. That's there to take up space or give you some exposition. I mean, if, if, if they are there, Oh, you're talking about like uh, Hannibal and um, red dragon. Like, yeah. Red dragon. Um, I actually kind of like both of the sequels. I think Hannibal is probably the worst. Um, yeah, but I mean, even Hannibal has some stuff in it that's kind of memorable and fun. Well, he's still so. like, like he's still Hannibal Lecter. You know, like it's like that part remains intact, even if the rest of the movie is nowhere near as strong as the uh, original. Yeah, I mean, if you compare it to Silence of Lambs, you're gonna walk away like meh. That was, but if you just like take it on its own and be like, yeah, this is a pretty fucking entertaining flick. And then, uh, yeah, poor Ray Liotta. Ray Liotta has, you know, one of the most <laughs> gruesome and funny 
kind of darkly humorous death scenes ever filmed in a movie in Hannibal. Yeah. I've definitely never seen it done exactly like that anywhere else. <laughs> yeah. The one movie where it's been done. But, oh, fuck it. I'll, I'll ruin it for those of you that haven't seen it. Cause it's a fucking ancient movie. Um, yeah. If, if yeah, you haven't seen it yet, you know, whatever spoiler. Yeah, alert. <laughs> like fucking, <laughs> I don't even know how to explain it. Hannibal Lecter like, dopes him up and cuts his skull off. So his brain is exposed. And then just cuts pieces off of his brain and cooks them like hibachi style right in front of him. And yeah, while well, he's like him, feeds him his own like, brain. He's like so brain damaged that he's like barely even like cognizant. I mean, he's really not cognizant of what's going on. He's like alert he's like lobotomized basically and awake, but he's just like, ah, oh, something smells good. You know, it's just like, okay, yeah, all right, movie. <laughs> Fair enough, you know? So you're, pretty you're, good. You're having fun. I like you, you know? And then fucking, um, uh, what's his face as the deformed, the, the, the burn victim guy. Uh, God, he wasn't even credited. Wasn't it, wasn't it, was it Gary Oldman in that role or, or uh, who was it? There was some uh, famous actor in there that was like, not even really fucking credited with oh, the role. God, yeah. Who, who I can't remember. Fuck, who the fuck was that? Was that Ed Norton? Was it Gary Oldman? It was someone like that. One in the chat will fucking know. I think but, uh, it was yeah, Gary Oldman. He did a great job. Um, so the original Silence of the Lambs, based on a book. Um, Julianne Moore is terrible as Clarice, but she was pretty much cast because she looks very similar. Well, she's a redhead. I don't yeah. know if she, if her looks uh, go. They have a pretty that. similar looking face too, I guess. But I don't know. She's got a way a, rounder she, face than Jodie yeah, Foster does. That's true. But uh, she's, uh, yeah, Jodie Foster didn't want to do it for some reason or another, so whatever. And then uh, Red Dragon is, you know, like, uh, it's, it's, it's a good movie if you can it, accept the fact that Hannibal used to be fatter and older in the past. Yeah, because <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's a movie that goes back to the past, and he's fat and older, like, way fatter and way older, because there was no, like... <laughs> Uh, you know, Irishman technique yet. Yeah, they didn't have the that yet. So, uh, but he's not even a, he's not the central character in this either. Yeah, he's uh, he's a side character. He's a he, I mean, he's a very important side character. But he's uh, and I don't think that would have worked if not for uh, Ray Fine's really cool portrayal of the he's Red Dragon good Killer guy. Yeah, yeah, he's very good. So, um, so yeah, like I said, this movie based on a book. Uh, by a guy named Thomas Harris, published in 88. Uh, Harris based the character, to be fair, of Buffalo Bill on a bunch of different serial killers, um, not just Gein. A guy named Jerry Brudos, who was a necrophile who strangled women in Oregon and dressed up in their clothes. Ted Bundy, um, who used the ruse of pretending to be injured, which... Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, James Gum does in this. Um, several times oh, man, he, he used yeah. that. Yeah, he uses that as a ploy uh, to ask his victims for help before attacking them. Uh, Garyam Heidnick, who kidnapped, raped, and tortured six women in Philadelphia, uh, who he held in a pit in his basement. Mm. Um, Ed Kemper, the co-ed killer who, like yeah. Gum, killed his grandparents as a teenager just to see what it felt like. Um, Gary Ridgway, the Green River killer, who dumped uh, bodies of his first five victims into the river. Um, also known for inserting foreign objects into the corpse's throats, wow. which James they Gunn really does. he really did fucking borrow from uh, pretty liberally, yeah, from a lot of different killers, and uh, and, and it works uh, amazingly, you know. Uh, uh, have you guys seen ever seen Manhunter? Manhunter? And what did you think of it? It's an adaptation of Red Dragon. I have seen it. I don't remember much about it, and I remember not liking it. It's um, it's a it's a way more stark interpretation. Um, the dude playing. Hannibal is way less of a character in that. They actually used a pretty similar script for Red Dragon and Manhunter. A lot of the stuff is, I don't know, it, it almost seems like they adapted the Manhunter script in a Red Dragon more than they actually adapted the source material. Yeah. But um, uh, it's a very, it's the Francis Dollarhide portrayal in um, Manhunter is way less sympathetic, which I think kind of takes away from it a little bit. And the guy who plays Hannibal is not as good as Anthony Hopkins, obviously. He's not yeah. bad. He's not doing a terrible job. It just doesn't, he doesn't bring to the role what was brought to it later. Um, and there's less of it. 
And uh, I don't know. It just way it feels way more, I think, generic in some ways. But it is kind of a cool, like, if you want, like, a stark kind of stripped down version of it, I think it is. It's, it's kind of watchable. I'd have to watch it again. It's been so many years since I took a look at it. Um, but uh, yeah, the uh, obviously the portion of uh, this portrayal of of uh, Buffalo Bill, uh, the thing that people remember most and and gets mentioned more than any of the things that I've talked about so far is that he uh, skins the women and makes like oh he's his goal is to, and it's not like to bring his mother back. In in the movie, it's to transition uh, from a male into a female, right? In some way, uh, but they do make they do kind of make sure to me. let you know that that's not like a <laughs> they do, they don't throw trans people under the bus with that. They're like he's not really trans; he's just fucking crazy. Yeah, he's insane. Yeah. They trans like people let, don't make skin suits. They make I mean, they make sure to fuck. I think that was pretty socially responsible of them to throw that in there too. Like that's not this is not normal. Uh, it was transsexual at that time, but. This is not normal transsexual behavior. He's not actually transsexual. He's just a fucking crazy dude looking for an identity, basically. Yep. Um, House of a Thousand Corpses, another movie that takes heavily from Ed Gein. Um, in particular, one character in it, uh, Otis Driftwood, I think his name is. Mm-hmm. Um, so his this is a cult classic type of film. Uh, wasn't well received when it got released but had a lot of like well this was rob zombie's first film and there was like kind of a big deal made about it because um you know he you didn't really see that too much uh like a fucking big rock star transitioning to film director it definitely and, helped uh, the buzz around this film but i remember uh it not doing well critically but mm -hmm. that it was it was one of those ones that if rotten tomatoes had existed back then it would have had a, like a high audience score you know probably yeah I, I mean like i think that most i mean like you know i think audiences reactions were mostly positive maybe a little bit mixed but i think you know if you're a fan of the horror genre you know that you could do a lot fucking worse than house of a thousand corpses it's not a terrible movie it's not it's great a, it kind of comes across like a texas chainsaw ripoff in a lot of ways it's, but it's entertaining and what more can you ask of a movie you know right you know i mean if you're if you went in looking for fucking Macbeth or something you know obviously you're gonna be pretty fucking disappointed but i mean if well, you were you, looking for like a fucking crazy ass horror movie directed by rob zombie yeah i mean it's pretty fucking decent yeah um so yeah, there's a lot of pop culture references in House of a Thousand Corpses. Uh, all of the characters, like all of the killer characters in it, are named after Groucho Marx characters from the 30s. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of those characters, Otis B. Driftwood, played by Bill Mosley, uh, is a direct reference to Gein. Um, Otis, named after Marx's character from A Night at the Opera, is the most violent member of the Firefly family. I don't know if that's true. Uh, well, I guess is it cool. is. I mean, he, we're, he's the one we get to see inflicting the most uh, uh, pain, but I don't know. A tiny, I feel like, is probably the most violent member. This of the is family. cool, if true. Someone in our chat says that their friend Dusty edited House of a Thousand Corpses for Rob Zombie. So that's neat. I don't know if that's true, but you know, and it's a small world out there, so it very well could be. So sure. pretty cool. I mean, true. If somebody if knows false... the dude that somebody knows the dude that edited, right. you I mean, know, he's, he's got, he's presumably got the guy that edited this movie knows people. So, you know, <laughs> maybe you're one of them. And if that's, <laughs> if that's, if that's true, cool. And if it's not true, sad, you know, yeah. Sad that you would <laughs> glomp onto that, but hey, <laughs> very <you know>? sad. <laughs> if it's true, Hey, rock on man. Cool. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, you know, captain Spalding is also, uh, a little geenish. Um, he's always my favorite. He was my favorite one. Well, yeah. I mean, it's just a great portrayal. Um, and you know, no, most notably, of course, the the whole Ed Gein wearing people's skins. Otis does that as well, making different implements out of human skin and shit. He does it. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess you could say that both House of a Thousand <laughs> Corpses and The Devil's Rejects were, you know, had a little Gein. Yeah, and them. I guess uh, probably that third one maybe too, but I didn't see that. So what? I know he was in that too, but so that's the last, uh, that's the last of our Gein references. Uh, probably not the probably, probably a lot more stuff, uh, based at least a little partially on Ed Gein than, than those, but yeah, those are some definitely interesting major examples and shit. It's just funny. Like the dearth of different character types that you get out of the, the you know, the baseline Ed Gein story. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's a fucking fascinating dude. I mean, like, you know, say what you want. There's a reason, like, people always, I hate this thing that the people do. They're like, oh, man, fucking people remember the names of the serial killer, but not the victims. It's like, because the victims were normal people. There's no reason for them to be remembered. We don't remember normal people because they're normal. Yeah. We remember a fucking weirdo who makes lampshades out of human skin. That's who you fucking remember, okay? Yep. I'm sorry it's that way, but it just is. Three from Hell is a bad action movie. Uh, wrong. It doesn't exist. Okay. Three yeah. from Hell was never made, Captain Howdy. Um, it doesn't exist. <laughs> it's not a real it's, thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a product of uh, mass delusional hysteria that people think they've seen this film. It's like one of those fucking uh, Mandela it's, effect things. Yeah, it's like a, that uh shazam or kazam or whatever the fuck with um, never happened like there, shit, you know? there are people that say absurd things about this movie they say that like um guy that played captain howdy i can't remember what, what's his name again you remember his name captain oh you mean captain spaulding or captain spaulding yeah sorry yeah it, uh oh shit i normally know his name it's like Ah, chattel fucking no uh but yeah, uh, yeah there, there are people that say that like at the beginning of that that guy's brought out all sid cancer Hague. ridden and horrible like and he just yeah poor sid Haig, dude sid Haig. Yeah, can you no, imagine no, no. can you imagine if rob zombie had actually done that it actually yeah, brought out cancer stricken sid Haig for like <laughs> to choke out some lines while he's like <laughs> wincing yeah. in pain from his treatments and shit that'd have been that'd have been horrible yeah it wouldn't it never happen uh, another movie inspired by real events, uh, Scream from 1996, a movie that I don't think gets its due and proper. Like, especially the first one is a good ass movie, dude. Yeah, like, I watched Scream um, eh, probably about two years ago. Yeah, it hasn't been that long for me either, but uh, it's one of those movies I've watched pretty consistently since it was re released at least once a year, maybe, you know, once every other year. Mm hmm. Um, but, you, you know, it's kind of it was a huge cultural phenomenon in the 90s, the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, still to this day, you'll like tonight, you'll probably have like nine kids show up to your door wearing this mask. I mean, it's still like one of the most popular Halloween masks of all time. Um, Many of the fans uh, of the film remember the opening scene, which is one of the most brilliant opening scenes in horror movies, by the way. It's just it is great. Yeah. Um, it, like really genuinely scary. Uh, Drew Barrymore so often, um, you know, parodied and shit too. And like, you know, Drew Barrymore was a big enough name at the time where you're like not thinking she's gonna just like be dead in the opening uh, shit. But I'll spoil it. Well, they put her in the fucking. Yeah, they, I mean, she's in the fucking in the, poster and shit. Yeah, they put her in the poster of it like prominently. Um, something that uh a lot of fans of this movie don't know is that the original movie was inspired by a series of murders in Gainesville, Florida, uh, taking place over the course of three nights, um, resulting in uh, five deaths. All of the victims were stabbed and posed in a very specific way, which is what this killer does <laughs> in Scream. Um, it's the guy that, that done done it. Um. He's uh, Edward Lee Humphrey. Oh, well, no, this isn't Edward. Sorry. He was the original guy that they thought did it, and they almost gaveled him up. But then they found this guy, Danny Rowling, um, arrested a few times, mostly for theft, uh, but had to flee his hometown in Louisiana after he shot his father twice in the head. But what really sealed him as a suspect was the fact that he uh, was wanted for the murder of another family in Shreveport who had all been stabbed and staged in various ways. So they, they found a crime that was similar and was able to pin both of them. There was no trial because um, he just waived his right to a trial and pled guilty. He's like, um, yeah, I did it. Fuck okay. you. <laughs> uh, when screenwriter Kevin Williamson saw a special about the Gainesville murders on TV, when he was home uh, alone one night, he began to fear that a murderer was waiting for him outside the house. Uh, so he, I, I used to get this a lot more when I was younger that like you watch a movie and then you're afraid that something from that movie or you hear a story and, and then, you know, that fight or flight kicks in. Yeah. You like look out your window like, oh shit, <laughs> something's coming. You know, I guess when he heard about it, uh, the screenwriter was house sitting for a friend. He says, I was house sitting for a friend of mine. I walk into the family room and I just see that one of the windows are open. And so I freaked out. 
Um, so he said he went in their kitchen and got a butcher knife and walked into every room and closet in the house, checking it. Um, and he called a friend on the phone to say like, Hey, stay on the phone with me. Cause I think somebody's in the house, you know, but he'd gotten himself. So, <laughs> so this guy had out. a really overactive imagination basically. Right. But, uh, that incident, you know, it inspired him as a creator and he uh, wrote Scream as a result of it. So that's pretty interesting. That's pretty cool. Take your fear, turn it into a horror movie. Uh, last one I've got tonight is The Birds. This is a really weird one. Yeah, that is pretty the, weird. Probably the closest to like true events too because like I don't know. It didn't get this bad, but there was an incident Uh of birds attacking people and all kinds of crazy shit that happened that inspired this movie. Um, so it happened in August, 1961 Capitola, this little central California coastal town. Uh, it's near Santa Cruz. Um, just a little, you know, at this time, I'm sure a really sleepy little beach town or whatever. Now it's probably a pretty big tourist destination. Um, but uh, people woke up that morning uh, with, like, the, one of the craziest shit. I don't know. Like, there were hordes of seabirds who kept dive-bombing their houses, breaking their windows, dive-bombing their cars. Um, and then when they would land, they would puke up a bunch of shit wherever they landed. So they would, they would dive-bomb. They dive-bombed people, houses. Uh, like municipal structures, cars, trucks, and then landed and puked their guts up over everything. <laughs> what? Um, and at the time, like scientists couldn't explain it. So that makes it doubly scary. You know, there was never like a story of like, here's what happened with that bird attack in Capitola. So it inspired the birds. Now, um, scientists have figured out what happened, or at least what they think happened. They can't, you know, go back in time and prove it. But they have a working hypothesis yeah, they got a, now. They got a working theory. Um, <laughs> so they say it was a uh, uh, poisoning from this acid called domoic acid. Ah. Uh, and this very same neurotoxin that comes from algae that blooms in certain types of conditions off uh, the coast in the ocean. Um, and when there, when certain conditions are met, it's a huge producer of this like domoic acid. Um, it also is, like has halted the Dungeness crab season in California in the past because it poisons the meat. Oh shit. Um, so yeah, if, if you ingest it, it can cause vomiting, diarrhea, short-term memory loss. You get real sick. Um, marine animals, uh, will exhibit all of those things and have seizures. Um, and now public health agencies periodically test for it. So it's like one of the things that they test for, but back in the sixties, they hadn't even identified this different type of algae. And I said, they're just like, yeah, we don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so you, that had to be pretty spooky to live through. And I, I didn't know that uh, the birds was based on a real event. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty fucking nuts. Cause, uh, you know, bunch of birds going fucking ape shit <laughs> attacking people and shit it's like you don't like think of that as like oh yeah that's and like then puking story. all over everything which like for whatever reason just makes it even more horrifying you know yeah because you know it's, a, it's bad enough the birds attacking you then it fucking pukes on you it's fucking okay cool yeah also so pandemic i guess could be in, is inspired by it as well yeah oh yeah being pandemic so. being a fucking blatant <laughs> rip off of the birds almost as good Almost, not quite. Just, yeah, just shy of being as good as the birds. Just, just barely shy, you know. But almost, you know, really, really close. So, um, you know, Halloween is a is a day filled with a uh, fake, fake blood, fake murder, fake killing. You know, you watch a horror movie where everything's pretend. Maybe not as pretend as we think, because you know Paul's whole thing was about how like a lot of this shit is based in reality. Yep. But uh, you know, sometimes people really do. I mean, murders happen, right? And sometimes those murders happen on Halloween. 
True. It's a fucking fact of life, you know? I mean, that's just statistics, you know? Right. It's a good, statistically, it's impossible that Halloween is just, like, avoided as a murder date. Yeah, so like for some, so that means that you know every year for some people, the the fear of like the murderer prowling around the bend on Halloween night is a fucking reality. You know, someone's gonna fucking someone's getting murdered tonight. Multiple people, like lots of fucking murders are gonna happen. Um, you know, and, for, and you know for a lot of people, it's gonna be just like you know. Uh, territorial disputes for, you know, the rights to sell drugs in a certain place or something like that. But, you know, for some people, it's going to be way more of that classic Halloween fucking murder. And sure. that's kind of what my sections is about sections about here, you know? Cool. Just going to talk about some fucking, uh, some actual murders that happened on Halloween night. We're going to start with um, Ronald Clark O'Brien, the man that killed Halloween. This guy right here. Oh, shit. I see. This is the motherfucker that should be played by Vince Vaughn. You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, yeah, he looks a lot more like Vince Vaughn <laughs> for sure. I don't think anybody should be played by Vince Vaughn, honestly. Yeah, it's too mean. One of my fears is a blade I blacksmith being used by a psycho. Also, Paul and I, isn't that kind of like if you're a fucking like making weapons and knives, shouldn't that be like your greatest aspiration? Yeah, someday I mean, you're you don't have anything to do with it. it. Yeah, I mean, no one can blame you, so you know. But you it's can like be like Tori yeah. Hanzo, man. He's like, uh, I, you know, like I, I will no longer create instruments of death. You know, just make the proclamation that like my blades can only slay the uh, the guilty, the innocent. They will not cut. And then you know, then all your victims, or you know, the victims of whoever finds your knife, you know, is gonna, uh, you know, they're they're all bad people. And you said you uh, sent me the presentation for History of Blades. I'll take a look at it. I'm, I don't log into Twitter anymore, but I'll uh, I'll do it to find that. The Poisoned Halloween Candy. The Case of Ronald Clark O'Brien. This is just like, the because every year after this, there were there's been a scare and there's never been another incident of this like yeah this is the uh and this was this was a uh, you know th there's never been an instance i don't think in recorded history of someone giving out poison candy and this is not that e anyway this is a uh, this is a dude who poisoned his own his own kid i believe yeah um it's not halloween yet it actually is but i was looking at some crimes having a month of october just kept coming up I heard about this case uh one at a time, but never got uh, into the details. So Ronald, his wife, uh, Daneen, and their kids, Timothy and Elizabeth, in Deer Park, Texas. Ronald was an optician in Houston. He was also a deacon at their church. On October 31st, 1974, Ronald took Timothy and Elizabeth trick-or-treating. Jim Bates, who was the O'Brien's neighbor, joined them along with his son. The kids were running out ahead of the parents and uh, were going to every house, even if the lights were off. They were banging on doors, but many houses weren't giving out candy. Fuck those houses, by the way. A little while later, Ronald uh, caught up with the uh, group with five pixie sticks. He said he got them from a house where no one answered the door earlier. He gave the pixie sticks to his kids, their neighbor, and another kid from the church. As many kids uh, want to do when they get home from trick-or-treating, Timothy wanted to eat some candy before bed. His father said it was fine, and Timothy wanted the pixie sticks. Uh, after eating some, he said he tasted, it tasted bitter. Ronald gave Timothy some Kool-Aid to wash it down with. It didn't help, and Timothy began vomiting and convulsing. Timothy died less than an hour uh, from when he uh, chose to have the pixie sticks, and he died on his way to the hospital. So in the autopsy, they found uh, a, a scent of almonds coming from the boy's mouth. The autopsy found that the pixie sticks were laced with potassium cyanide, which... Uh, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but potassium cyanide is poisonous. Yeah, you shouldn't ingest it. Don't eat potassium cyanide. So the police were able to recover all the candy. The last trial that they uh, had to track down was unable to get his candy open as it was stapled shut. <laughs> okay. Well, thank that kid's dumbness might have saved him in this instance. Uh, yeah. The Pixie Six were opened, refilled with potassium powder, and resealed and stapled. Um, so wait, this dude fucking handed these kids some like, yeah, these, um, see these shady ass, uh, pixel, uh, pixie sticks with, uh, staples in them. Yeah. That's, uh, I got that from that mysterious house over there. You kids have them. The police tried to get Ronald to retrace the steps and tell him where he got the candy. Couldn't remember. 
And uh, the person who owned the house uh, had opened the door just a crack and gave him the candy. He said all he could see was the man's hairy arm. The police were obviously skeptical. The police were not skeptical at that point. The police were just like, this is bullshit. Uh, yeah. The house belonged to a man named Courtney Melvin, who was almost immediately ruled out because he was at work that night. He was an air traffic controller at William P. Hobby Airport. That's a pretty not, good alibi, you know? Yeah. He was directing air traffic. He does not have time to poison a bunch of kids meaninglessly on Halloween. Uh, so all of the uh, evidence led back to the same person, Ronald. They found out that Ronald was in over $100,000 in debt, was unable to keep a job. His car was about to re be repossessed, and uh, his house was getting foreclosed on. He had taken out a life insurance policy on his kids. Uh, he had called his uh, insurance company the day after Timothy died about collecting the policy on his son. He also visited a chemical supply store in Houston to buy cyanide. He continued to tell police he was innocent, even though the evidence was piling up. So not exactly a master fucking criminal. Yeah, whoopsie you know? daisy. You know, they they know he bought the cyanide. <laughs> no one saw this mysterious guy give him this fucking obviously tampered with candy. He took out a huge life insurance policy on his kids. The so what you're telling before. me is this dude was no Bond villain. No. <laughs> I don't think James Bond would struggle much against this guy. It's more of like an evil Homer Simpson. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so on uh, he was right on November 5th, 1974, he was arrested for his son's murder. Uh, he was indicted on one count of capital murder and four counts of attempted murder. He pled not guilty. Uh, there were many people, many of uh, Ronald's friends and a chemist that Ronald had uh, shown, uh, you know, an unusual interest in cyanide and asked the chemist how much would be fatal. Apparently, the amount of cyanide that was in Timothy's pixie stick was enough to kill two adults, and the amount in the other pixie sticks was enough to kill four adults. Ronald was dubbed the Candy Man during the trial. On June 3rd, 1975, Ronald was found guilty of capital murder and four counts of attempted murder and sentenced to death. Uh, afterwards, his wife filed for divorce uh, and remarried. Her new husband adopted her uh, daughter, who had survived. Apparently, while Ronald was in prison, he did not get along with the other inmates who hated him for killing a child, especially his own son. Ronald was executed on March 31st, 1984. Before he was executed, he tried uh, one last time to say he was innocent. His last words were, I forgive all, and I do mean all, those who have been involved in my death. God bless you all, and may God's best blessings be always yours. Uh, all right. All right, then. All right, psycho. <laughs> Apparently, after he was executed, many people outside were yelling things like trick-or-treat and showering people with candy. Um, final thoughts. The case is heartbreaking. All Timothy wanted was go trick-or-treating. Yeah, yeah, we well, you know. <laughs> we don't need your fucking commentary. I get it. I, I, I can provide my own. So yeah, the dude, uh, so this, and by the way, this, this one little incident is why, uh, you hear all this fucking fear monger about poison candy, razor blades and apples, blah, literally, blah, blah, literally every year. And every year it's like a different, like, well, not maybe not every year. When I was a kid, it was always razor blades and candy. Yep. And that was actually, uh, I actually looked into the whole razor blades and candy thing. Mm -hmm. Do you know what movie that was traced back to? Because it's it's like it's one of those things that started in the 80s. Hmm. Um, no, I can't think offhand. Demon Knight, dude. Remember the little overarching story of the crotchety old man that hates the the Halloween trick-or-treaters or whatever? <laughs> he puts razor blades in their candy or something. Well, he he's gonna he's only gonna give them apples and he puts razor blades in the apples. And then at the end, his wife bakes him an apple pie. Oh, <laughs> With the razor. Oh, apples. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And he dies. Yeah. yeah. I remember this now. So he that, like, that wait, is, let me see. Let me see if I'm, I'm remember, tell me if I'm remembering this or if this is like my brain doing like he eats the apple pie and then he like his throat like cuts open from the inside and he like yes. bleeds. Does no, that happen? That happens. Yeah. Okay. He, yeah. He bleeds all over the then. pie and then <laughs> goes dead face down in it. Good for him. Fuck him. What a piece of shit. <laughs> May he rot in hell. Um, now here's a little bit of a uh, footage from the trial. Um, of this guy here, this winner. Oh, Jesus whispers Macmillan. 
Yeah. Or maybe you didn't share the thing. Oh, yeah. I don't think I shared the fucking audio. I'm a dumbass. Typical Dude, TJ. I, I didn't see any of it this year, but last year it was like, be forewarned. People are going to hand out weed gummies that look like normal candy. And yeah, like, like, oh, no. yeah. People are going to waste their fucking expensive weed gummies on your fucking stupid kids. That's going to happen. Yep. And family. Bates said that before Halloween, O'Brien asked if he could bring his children over to trick or treat. With there used to be very different standards for being a, a reporter on the scene, you know? Yeah. She's very much like, she's like speaking way more like a human being. They hadn't yet developed the news anchor uh, cadence, you know? True. Tom, I'm here at the scene where... <laughs> With the Bates children on Halloween night, both families ate dinner together, and then the fathers took the children trick-or-treating. Bates said O'Brien went to one house where no one appeared to be home, and after the children had scampered ahead to the next house, O'Brien came off the front porch carrying the pixie sticks. He gave the pixie sticks to the children, and then... This guy's a moron, too, because wouldn't it have made more sense just sneak the pixie sticks into the candy at the end of the night? Yes. And just be like, oh, I don't know where they got that shit. Instead, you, like, literally have this dumb narrative. Like, I don't know why I'm giving you advice on how to do this better, but, like, yeah, you don't... It seems like common sense. Right. Like, if you're gonna, if you're trying to figure out some way to fucking poison your your own kids with, like, some tainted Halloween candy, just toss that shit in the bag at the end of the night. And then who knows where the fucking where that come from? I don't fucking know. Somewhere. I mean, we went trick or treating into a lot of houses. I'm not sure where the where the fuck that came from. Instead of it's just like he went off to some house that looked dark and then came back with some weird stapled together pixie sticks. It's like what? And also Aww. the fact that this dumbass moron used fucking staples to fucking put the fucking pixie sticks back together. Like so what? Stupid. Like this guy. Like home. I mean. I think even Homer Simpson would have been like, this isn't going to work. You know what I mean? Like, fuck. And later took them back and said he wanted to stop at his car for a moment. Bates said when O'Brien came back into the Bates house, he returned the pixie sticks to the children. Later that night, Timothy O'Brien died from eating a poisoned pixie stick. Gee, <laughs> I mean, it seems like it'd be the crime of the century. It's kind of weird that he didn't get away with it because... Very well conceived, masterfully executed plan, bro. You nailed it. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, like, talk about the fucking, like, this dude, he's like the king of misdirection, you know? <laughs> like, oh, wow. You, you really fucking figured some shit out, buddy. You really fucking nailed this one. Right. <sighs> All right. What a moron. Here's his last statement. The final words of a genius. In a few moments is wrong. However... This is, I don't think what this is, is actually him saying it. What is about to a few moments is wrong. However, we as human beings do make mistakes and errors. This execution is one of those wrongs, yet doesn't mean our whole system of justice is wrong. Therefore, I would forgive all who have taken part in any way in my death. Also, to anyone I have offended in any way during my 39 years, I pray and ask your forgiveness, just as I forgive anyone who offended me in any way. And I pray and ask God's forgiveness for all of us respectively as human beings. To my loved ones, I extend my undying love. To those close to me, know in your hearts I love you one and all. God bless you all, and may God's best blessings be always yours. Ronald C. O'Brien P.S. During my time here, I have been treated well by all TDC personnel. What a good guy. He's going straight to heaven. Yep. Straight to heaven. That almost like seals it for me. Is like, oh, he's one of these fucking religious nuts and it invoked God or whatever in his final statement. Like, yep, he done did it. He done it. Just want you to know this is a mistake. mistake. But it's a I huge amount you. of those people are fucking deranged, dude. I forgive you for what you're about to do to me. About this winter. This guy does not even oh, look boy. like a real dude, dude. No, he doesn't. Another Texan, too, by the way. What the fuck are you doing in Texas? So it this, looks uh, like you typed a uh, inbred moron into one of those AI art things. <laughs> yeah, and it's just like, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> yep. 
Amen. Uh, and this is the elderly nun that he raped and murdered. Oh, my God. How are you going to rape a nun, man? I know. Uh, was Johnny Frank Garrett a sadistic nun killer or an innocent man put to death? Dun, dun, dun. He was a nun killer. I'll, I'll, he's a nun killer for sure. So on October 31st, Halloween 1981, Sister Tadia Benz, a Catholic nun, was brutally raped and murdered in the St. Francis Convent in Amarillo, Texas. I think it's actually pronounced Amarillo, but whatever. Amarillo, yes. Amarillo, Texas. Uh, Jonathan Frank Garrett lived across the street and would later be convinced, I'm sorry, convicted and sentenced to death for killing the 76-year-old Benz. Uh, in the aftermath, two things would be disputed, whether Garrett actually committed the crime and whether his uh, infamous last words were actually spoken. Tadia Ben's uh, murder and Johnny Frank's Garrett's arrest. Um, so her body was found in the morning by another nun. She was naked with blood on her face. In the convent's community room was a broken window. The sisters called the police, who collected evidence that included a knife under the bed, Benz's uh, bed linens, fingerprints lifted from the knife's blade, uh, the neighbor's headboard, uh, I'm sorry, the bed's headboard, and the uh, cut window screen. An additional kitchen knife was found in the driveway outside. Uh, after the uh, autopsy revealed some stab wounds, uh, contusions to the head, abrasions to the neck, uh, pathologists ruled that the cause of death was manual strangulation. Additional signs of external bleeding and internal uh, trauma indicated forcible rape. On the night of the murder, a witness claimed to have seen Johnny Frank Garrett running from the direction of the convent. The knife found in the driveway also matched the design, make, and degree of use as a knife recovered from uh, his home. So basically a similar knife, probably from the same set. Uh, Johnny uh, Frank Garrett was arrested on November 9th. At his trial, the prosecution uh, obviously said that he did it, and uh, he maintained his innocence, but was found guilty, sentenced to death, placed on death row at Texas's Ellis Unit Prison. Uh, he was set to be executed on January 6, 1992. However, he was given a reprieve by Governor Ann Richards at the request of Pope John Paul II. Uh, so they got the, the Pope and himself got involved like, no. <laughs> Ultimately, however... Uh, the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles uh, voted 17 to 0 to uphold the death sentence. So they're just like, fuck that. Fuck the Pope. We don't give a shit. You're going to hell, bitch. So uh, on February 11th, 1992, at the age of 28, he was executed by lethal injection. His last meal was ice cream, but his last words remain in dispute. Garrett was quoted as saying, I'd like to thank my family for loving me and taking care of me. The rest of the world can kiss my ass. After Garrett's execution, speculation continued as to the potential innocence, or his potential innocence, and the uh, humanity of his execution in general. He was uh, mentally impaired, had some brain damage. A uh, mental health expert described Garrett as one of the most virulent histories of abuse and neglect I encountered in 28 years of practice. Uh, Garrett was allegedly raped, uh, regularly beaten by his stepfather, forced to perform sexual acts from, uh, for pornographic films, uh, his family introduced him to drugs and alcohol when he was just 10 years old. He was exposed to brain-damaging substances like paint thinner. Uh, this information was not presented to the jury during his trial. Uh, separate from the issue of abuse, DNA evidence found in 2004 linked another man, uh, another criminal, a man named Leoncio uh, Perez Ruada, to the murder of Benz. Uh, Rada pleaded guilty to a crime that took place a few months prior to Benz's killing, the rape and murder of another woman uh, named Narni Box Bryson. Texas Attorney General Jesse Quackenbush was so intrigued by the case that he made a documentary film called The Last Words about uh, uh, Johnny Frank Garrett's case. He argued that the case was a result of overzealous prosecutors saying... Uh, the old and newly discovered evidence of Johnny Frank Garrett's innocence is so compelling it will cause even the most bloodthirsty proponents of the death penalty to shake their heads in doubt. As for Garrett's last words, despite the widely reported and repeatedly quoted final remarks by Garrett, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice website states that he declined to make a final statement. So probably a dude gaffled up by the Texas system, ultimately. Huh. Um, but, you know, it's kind of easy to fucking frame a dude <laughs> that fucking looks like this, you know. Well, here's a trailer for that uh, 
for a movie about you convict that devil I swear to God he will kill again find the defendant guilty of rape this, this looks like an A and E movie or it something. It does. This is like some super low budget y shit. The Hallmark Channel presents probably, yeah. probably not the Hallmark Channel because it's rape and murder, but still, it like is that level of quality. You know, like the A and yeah, A and E, yeah. Yeah, you did. Go to jail, bitch. We're assembled here today to witness the execution. Is he a Geico caveman now? I don't know, man. <laughs> He's They're really trying to make him look like insurance. fucking Charlie Manson or something to spice uh -huh. this up. Execution of Johnny Frank Gary. Anything you want to say to us right now, son? I would like to tell you for a final time that I am innocent. <laughs> man, this <laughs> <laughs> this looks fucking bad. Yeah, what a terrible looking movie. How about this guy, Paul? You think this guy did it? What's he up to? You know what this guy did, Paul? Guess. I mean, obviously it's a murder, but yeah, I mean, like you're you're just saying like what kind of murder? Yeah, what kind of what kind of murder you think this dude did? Um. Fuck. My brain is torn in two directions. One of them is he killed his parents because mm -hmm. he hated them. And the other is he killed like a, a like a spurned girlfriend or whatever, like a girl that wouldn't go out with him or whatever the fuck. Mm. A murderous Halloween. The Lisk family massacre. Okay, so he killed his parents. When Halloween becomes the perfect time for a killer to hide among the innocent and slowly slip away. <laughs> so I was right. He killed his parents. Uh, Halloween has always been the perfect time to terrify. We know this. The Lisk family came into being when Susan and William Lisk decided to get married in 2001, trying, uh, tying themselves together uh, and their respective children. While Susan had two sons from a previous marriage named Devin and Derek, William had one. Uh, William had uh, one called William BJ Jr. <laughs> BJ. Susan's sons did have a good relationship relationship with William, as far as uh, a stepfather and stepsons go. However, one couldn't say that uh, BJ extended the same courtesy to Susan as his stepmother. As a result, their family constantly struggled with the idea of unity, ending up in positions where William was torn between uh, his loyalty to his wife and his son. However, that did not stop him from trying to do so until he took his last breath. And it was on a horrifying Halloween night in October 31st. A typical oh, day for Devin, Susan's elder son, as he returned home from church after spending the night See? at his biological I father's told you, house. Man. Church, like that's one of the things they look for when they look for serial killers is like extreme religiosity is not, you know, not all of them are, but it's an indicator. You know what I mean? These people are fucking nuts. Hoping to unwind, Devin took no notice of his surroundings as he made his way towards his room to indulge in a few hours of video games. However, halfway into the game, he started to realize the house was a bit too quiet for this time of day. No one was bustling with activity as they usually do. Considering it was Halloween Eve, he had half expected everyone to be prancing with excitement, trying to get everything ready for that night. A little confused, he made his way to his parents' room, thinking he would rouse them from their sleep. Seeing them both with their uh, red quilt over their heads, Devin started speaking to them, hoping to wake them up gently. However, he got no response. His panic started mounting as he went to his mother's side of the bed and shook her. No response. He pulled the blanket off her, and William, and the last thing he remembered was all the blood before he screamed, cried, and ran out of the house calling for his aunt, uh, calling his aunt for help. So he was not the killer, unless he's unless this story is all a, a fucking lie and he's uh, trying to cover up his crimes or whatever. Oh, he didn't kill anybody? Um, the murder of three. Not that, not the religious one anyway. I think it was this guy. So little BJ here. That was Devin coming home from church. Oh, so he, th he, this dude didn't kill. I thought he killed his parents. So this is just like a family murder, like a home invasion murder or whatever. Oh, no, he's he's one of their kids, too. But oh. Devin, well, he, Devin then, he's, then he went to church, too. I don't know. 
Like church oh. is a family fucking thing. They it seems like he, it, it sounds like they went to it. Sounds like he went by himself because his parents weren't were there dead when he came back. He didn't even realize it. So oh. his parents didn't go. So he might just be like a weird religious dude. Yeah. Anyway, after the parents arrived at the scene, they went uh, right to the crime scene. Upon observation, it was revealed that William had been shot in the head and face about five times. On the other hand, Susan had been sexually assaulted before she was shot in the head three times at very close range. The sight was brutal to witness for her young son. The police uh, sent out to Derek's room, which Devin had uh, forgotten to check in his uh, flurry of anguish. However, the door to his room had been locked from the inside. The police broke it down and saw Derek curled up uh, on his bed with his back facing them, his face towards the wall next to his bed. His autopsy revealed he died from blunt force trauma to his head, a death that came as fast as it could before Derek uh, could feel more, more of the pain that could have been inflicted on him. In a matter of a few hours, Devin had lost all of his family without a word or reason. His brother's death also came as a blow while he was still reeling from the death of his mother and stepfather. The police had a fair idea about the murderer after finding evidence and how the scene uh, showed no signs of struggle. They deemed it could only have been an inside job with uh, uh, like the claw hammer with Derek's blood as well as uh, muddy footsteps near the family's deck. Although Devin could have easily been a suspect, the neighbors had claimed to hear what they sounded like gunshots around 6 a.m., when Devin was with his father, um, his background showed no red flags for being uh, capable of something like this either. However, there was one family member who did when the police looked into BJ's history, he had quite a criminal record in 2002. BJ had threatened to harm himself after a fallout with his father, William in 2004, he argued with Susan and punched her in the chest. He had hit Susan with a coffee mug just two months after that incident before running away with the, her car keys not long after that, he had also attacked his stepmother in the shower. Uh, his aggression towards her grew uh, more over the years. BJ reasoned uh, he didn't like authority. His stepmother tried to exert over the household. However, after every act of aggression, BJ was either hauled away by the cops or by his father. The police later released him because he was not competent to stand trial. Instead, he was taken to a mental facility to recuperate before William applied uh, for his guardianship. Um, so William had been made making an effort to reinstate his relationship with BJ a week before his murder. He had uh, taken his son on vacation with him on a deer hunting retreat. That's good. F feed the bloodlust. Right. <laughs> Everything seemed to be well when both BJ and William made it back safe and sound 24 hours before the murder on the night of their return. The father and son drank heavily with William allowing BJ to stay the night on the couch. After the murder, the police apprehended BJ in the same cabin he had stayed at while he vacationed with his father. Later, BJ pleaded guilty, allowing the death penalty to be taken off the table, but life in prison without parole taking its place. However, in 2011, BJ committed suicide in prison. Oh, darn. Yeah, poor guy. Poor scamp. Here's a little news. See, story. like, I'm, like none of these, none of these have anything to do with Halloween, though. I mean, they happen on Halloween, Halloween, but none of them are like. You know, like, have there been any like ritual killings where like a coven of Satanists have been like, yes, on all Hallow's Eve, we shall reap the Father's rewards? And well, here's a here's one that may, maybe this one will uh, meet your criteria. I don't know. Okay, this one is called John D. White, pastor of peril. Well, see, another fucking religion. Eddie. This is what I'm talking about, man. It's this guy's a he's a, this guy's a necrophiliac. So that's kind of neat. Anything the happens in your town and it's like unsolved, go check the church. The murderous pastor who craved sex with the dead. <laughs> oh my god. It's like that beginning of that Rob Zombie song. Who is this insatiable creature with a lust for the dead? I don't remember if that I don't think that was the exact words, but it was something like that. Um after killing Conway's mother, John D. White dressed the three-year-old uh, in his Halloween costume and dropped the oblivious boy off to his father in a grocery store parking lot. So when 24-year-old Rebecca Gay suddenly vanished in the small town of Broomfield Township, Michigan, Pastor John D. White asked his followers at the Christ Community Fellowship Church to pray for the young woman's safe return. It was Halloween 2012, and police scoured Isabella County looking for any trace of Gay. Pastor White was engaged to Sally Gay, Rebecca's mother, 
and she was one of his followers at the church. The pastor also sometimes babysat Rebecca's three-year-old son, Conway, so her vanishing seemed on the surface to be very troubling to John D. White, but the reality of the situation was much more disturbing than anyone could imagine. Pastor White's congregation had no idea that the person responsible for Rebecca Gay's disappearance was the man who had been preaching sermons to them for the past three years, a 55-year-old ex-convict with a dark and violent past and a dreadfully taboo obsession. As Halloween and the next day unfolded, the truth about what had happened to the missing woman came to light, and Pastor White's flock and the people of Isabella County learned what a supposed man of God was capable of. John D. White once told the 14 members of the Christ Community Fellowship Church, we need to check closely the seeds we sprout in ourselves. Nothing can be hidden from God. Pastor, uh, perhaps Pastor White should have taken the advice he preached to his followers. White was a troubled man whose past crimes were ghastly, but as a result of a dysfunctioning, dysfunctional justice system, he was a free man in 2012. White served in the Navy and worked as a long-haul trucker in his younger days. His first known violent attack against a woman occurred in 1980 when he was 22 years old. White lived in Battle Creek, Michigan, and at the time he was married. One day, he invited a 17-year-old neighbor named Teresa Etherton to his basement to check out a stock car racetrack he had set up. Without warning, White attacked the teenage girl, stabbing her 15 times and choking her. Etherton later told the police that White said, you're uh, going to go now. I'm really sorry you had to go like this, but what the fuck? You're just a woman. But Etherton survived the brutal assault and White was arrested. He was sent to prison, uh, but he appealed and won on the grounds that his attorney did not raise an insanity defense. White was released from prison in 1983 after only two years and was given two years probation and mandatory mental health treatment. Uh, Teresa Etherton had no idea that White was out of prison. And a few years later, she recognized his voice while standing in line and turned to see White smiling at her. Despite her attempted murder, John D. White was a free man. That's kind of fucked up. You're just like, isn't that the voice of the dude that tried to murder me? And <laughs> she's just standing there like, hey, it's me. How wow. you doing? Yeah, that is fucked up. You think if someone would have at least told her. Uh, yeah, she had no idea he was even out of prison. So in July 1994, 26-year-old Vicki Sue uh, Wall disappeared from Comstock Township, Michigan. John D. White was still married and uh, ha now had two children and another baby on the way. White worked a maintenance job at a textile company where he met Wall and uh, the two had an affair. Surveillance video at, from a grocery store parking lot showed Vicki Sue Wall getting into the back uh, to a black pickup truck with a bearded man at 3 a.m. It was the last time anyone saw her alive. So this dude's Damn. killed a bunch of women. Well, he's tried to kill one, successfully killed another, but still out there preaching. It's a good old, he's a good old preaching man. Harsh. Yeah, dude, like I said, man, if this, something happens in a shitty little town, like just tail everybody that's at, at the church. But anyway, let's you get to this recent incident here. In the earlier hours of Halloween, after drinking several beers... White walked to the mobile home of Rebecca Gay, the daughter of his fiance, in the same trailer park he lived in and entered her dwelling. White attacked Gay, hitting her in the head repeatedly with a rubber mallet until she was unconscious. Uh, he then tightened a zip tie around her neck, strangling her until she was dead. Gay's three-year-old son, Conway, was in the next room of the trailer. White then dumped Gay's lifeless body in a ditch behind some pine trees about a mile from the mobile home. After disposing of the corpse, he returned to Gay's trailer, looked after her son, he then dressed Conway in his Halloween costume and dropped the oblivious boy off to his father in the grocery store parking lot. When Rebecca Gay did not show up for work the next day, her co-workers reported her missing. Police searched for the young woman, and White made a plea to his members of his church to pray for her. The pastor was picked up by police and questioned. Investigators tried to appeal to White and told him that Gay's body would deteriorate and decompose in the cold, wet weather. A day later, later John D. White, the killer and church leader, admitted to the police he had killed her. And uh, gave her the gave them the exact location of the corpse. White told authorities that the murder had been fueled by pornographic videos that involved necrophilia. Well, if he's such a necrophiliac, why did he fucking get rid of the body, huh? He added good, that he didn't rem remember if he had sex with a uh, gay's dead body. Yeah, he okay, he did. I'm then. pretty sure you did. <laughs> I can't nobody, remember. <laughs> nobody know? fucking like can't remember whether they fucked the corpse or not. You know what I mean? That's I something mean, that you remember. <laughs> I mean, I don't recall, you know, it's like one of those, if you things, didn't, if you like, didn't, you'd be, you'd be like, hell no, I didn't, you know, you wouldn't be like, um, 
I don't think so, you know, possibly, but I would be a remote possibility. I don't know. Did I have sex with her body after I killed her? Um, um the details are kind of sketchy. <laughs> uh, Auntie Auntie, 1999. Uh, for just as, for as little as $7 a month, you can help TJ get new pants and new underwear. Please support uh, this habitual Brit shatter. Thank yeah. you so much. I mean, a lot of our budget on this show does go to new britches for TJ. So. Truth, 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 truth. So what is that? Is this one Halloween enough? Because, I mean, it involved necrophilia. It's more Halloween, but it still just feels like a crime that, you know, like had nothing to do with. But he's a right. habitual killer, you know, so like there's like. Right, yeah, uh, and, he, and he just happened to go out and you know, get himself a fucking body or whatever the fuck. Plus there was the, there was the fact that he dressed the kid in his Halloween costume and, you know, took him to his father. True. You know? so yeah. This one, this one is definitely our most Halloween tied one. I will give well, you that. What about the, I mean, the, the one, I think the one where the dad poisoned his kid with the pixie sticks is pretty Halloween. I feel like that too. had nothing to do with, well, I mean, I guess. Yeah. I mean, they were, it was, it was kind of related. It was related to trick or treat. I mean, it was killed with literally Halloween. Right, yeah. He was so, I mean, killed with Halloween candy. I get so it. I think these two are probably the strongest contenders. Yeah. Let's see. So uh, this one is literally called Gerald Turner, the Halloween killer. So let's see if this will uh, satisfy it. I'm still waiting for that sat Satanist slash Wiccan killer. You know what I mean? Well, maybe this will be it. Let's find out. This is a. Uh... I'm starting to think that those don't exist and that the like, if you really want to find out where to look for these people, look at the church. Like I said. Yeah, maybe the maybe, you know, maybe the maybe the uh, the evil you know, child sacrificing religion you've been looking for this whole time was just Christianity. Yeah, it was right under your nose. <laughs> yeah, it was hiding in plain sight, you know what I mean? On Halloween night, 1973, nine-year-old Lisa Ann French was trick-or-treating alone in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, when she approached the home of neighbor Gerald M. Turner. Finding the front door slightly open, she peeked inside and called out, trick-or-treat, Gerald Turner lured Lisa French into his house with promises of candy before brutally raping and strangling her in his bedroom. He then placed her body and clothing into several garbage bags before leaving her remains next to a farm just outside Fond du Lac. Police and 1,500 volunteers searched for Lisa and conducted door-by-door -door interviews with nearby... It's too bad none of those adults were available to, like, supervise her trick-or-treating. <laughs> like, I mean... Like, totally by herself, like, not even with friends or anything, you know? I mean, that is it's kind of unusual, but, dude, I never had any fucking parents walking around with me when yeah, I was Yeah, I mean, like, kid. even but if you don't have your parents, like, you went with your friends or somebody. Like, you didn't go yeah. by yourself. Yeah, usually I, I at least had one buddy with me. Yeah. Usually. You know, I don't for, remember like, ever fucking, going by for myself. For the sake of safety, you know, you can't be, like, totally on your own. Houses and neighbors. It was during these interviews that police first grew suspicious of Gerald Turner. Turner had a pending case involving the sexual assault of a young babysitter, and his story for what he was doing on Halloween night set off red flags with police. On November 3rd, 1970... Dude, what were you doing on Halloween night? I mean, I was, uh, you know, just a little raping and, I mean, um, uh, uh, macaroni pictures. I was, uh, ab abducting, I mean, instructing my wife on how to, uh, possibly rape i mean uh make uh, an apple pie you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know dude <laughs> can, I, can i i'm, I'm gonna be a curmudgeon here for a second yeah. before we get into curmudgeon, the of, up. curmudgeon it up dude i don't do i don't hand out candy on halloween no more no and the reason i don't is because i literally refuse to be like stared at and looked down at with a fucking flashlight from the curb by every goddamn overprotective parent in the goddamn neighborhood, like I'm some kind of rapist that's just willing to like get, <laughs> wait until nobody's looking to scoop one of their little booger eaters up. It's just like no, dude. Well, this is the guy you have to thank for that treatment, I guess. <laughs> I guess so. The owner of the farm discovered Lisa Ann's nude body and alerted police. Turner would be questioned by police two more times before they requested a sample of his hair and a fiber sample from the bedspread on his mattress. The hair and fiber samples were found to be a match with the ones pulled off Lisa's body. In fall of 1974, police conducted another interview with Turner and requested he take a polygraph test. 
but Turner refused. After pressure from law enforcement, Turner reluctantly took the polygraph. Police were not satisfied with the mostly inconclusive. I mean, I know it's like one of those tricks because, like, it's not admissible by court. But man, you really don't want to refuse a polygraph if the cops demand one of you. You know what I mean? Like, it just seems like it it immediately gives them like an inkling of your guilt or whatever the fuck. Yeah, I feel like that's more of the test than anything else because they don't they don't really give a like if you fail it it's not admissible in court if you pass it it's not like it fucking you know you've never i've never seen an episode of forensic i mean i've seen plenty of episodes of forensic files where like someone passes a polygraph and then later is found to be guilty I, forensic it, evidence like, from so what i've like, from what i've read about it it's useful as an interrogational tool as well like failing it has way more consequence in the context of being under interrogation than it actually does on the legal process or your or in or any indicator of your guilt. And so what happens is a lot of people who catastrophically fail these lie detector tests, which by the way, do measure stress response in a way that has, you know, is tied to lying. It's right. just they're not accurate enough. But like when somebody catastrophically fails one of these, it, the it, other problem though is that like total sociopaths tend to be fine because they don't, they're just like no. Well, no. it makes them like it, a good example of this is oh fuck, what is his name? There's a dude that like killed his whole family, killed his wife and his two little girls and like stuffed them in an oil rig or whatever and then like you can you can see his uh his interrogation online. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's on YouTube and a bunch of other places and shit. And the the way that they finally get him to drop his stupid bullshit story is they back him into the corner with the lie detector thing. Hmm. And at that point, like this is what the sociopaths do. He started making, he, he started making up another narrative. Like there's this, because, and this is all part of the interrogation process too. Cops want you to do this because you admit having some part in the crime in the process. But his story went from, I have no idea what happened to my family. They just disappeared this morning. And I, you know, nobody's heard from them to, Oh, my wife, killed one of the little killed the little girls in their sleep and then i found out about it and in a rage i killed her <laughs> you know yeah. what i mean of course, so he tries to cover his he tries to cover his ass because he feel he felt backed into a corner because he just catastrophically failed his lie detector test and so he comes up with this counter narrative or whatever oh so actually here's what really happened <laughs> yeah chris Watts <laughs> is his name time at one point during the interview Turner suggested to investigators that Lisa's death may have been an accident. After two more hours of course, see that's that's the kind of thing they're looking for. Because <laughs> once you've said that, it's like ah, so you do know something. Questioning, Turner confessed to the rape and murder of Lisa Ann French. Turner was sentenced to 38 years in prison. This dude's like eating lozenges as he's recording this. <laughs> you can hear the shit crinkling in the back. I know. <laughs> Lisa Ann French is dead. <laughs> then for second degree murder sexual perversion, enticing a child for immoral purposes, and indecent behavior with a child. However, due to regulations on prisoners with good behavior getting time taken off, Turner's sentence was cut in half, and he was paroled in 1992. What? <laughs> huh? <laughs> what? That's, the, that's a twist ending. <laughs> in 1993, authorities realized Turner had been released too early, so he was sent back to prison to serve okay. his remaining six years. Oops. So it was a mistake. Before he was released, an unsent letter addressed to Lisa Ann French was found in Turner's cell. Dear Lisa, I doubt that I could ever fully realize the terror you experienced at my hands. For that night of the children to have started out so joyous for you, only to end so tragically, will haunt me forever. I can still see you standing in the doorway with that felt hat beaming at having recognized me. Then I see the delight in your eyes turn to fear as I close the door behind you. The rest of my life I will have to live with what I did to you. On that night, I became a monster. I do swear to you on forfeiture of my life, I will never harm another child. Man Adults, though. Fair yeah, game. About, about <laughs> another person. <laughs> yeah, like, come on. You know, it seems like, you know, oddly specific wording. He fought yeah. against Turner's release and claimed he was still a violent sexual predator. However, no shit. he was paroled in 1998. In 2003, 
Gerald Turner violated his parole and was sent back to prison for 15 years for viewing and being in the possession of hardcore pornography. Gerald Turner is due to be released on February 7th, 2000. Wait, just porn? Yeah, wait. <laughs> this is kind of weird. It's like hardcore pornography. Like, it's like, huh? was it when child did, porn or was when it just did that regular become porn? A, I, I guess that, that maybe... Parole? Maybe because he's like, it's a sex crime, so they're just like any porn, you're going back to jail, bitch. I guess. That's a little weird, but okay. So um, here's uh, some of his petitions, I guess. Mark Hammer recorded Gerald Turner in the 1970s after authorities arrested him for the murder of nine-year-old Lisa French in Fond du Lac. He became known as the Halloween killer, and the case changed trick-or-treating habits in the Badger State. Municipalities and a lot of the places just reset their hours from like 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. during daylight hours, and it was absolutely obvious that no one was letting their kids go out alone. Yep, so this is why you get flashlighted, Paul. What you up to, buddy? what's I'm going on up there i'm just like you know what fuck this man you're you're like <laughs> you're gonna fucking like treat me like i'm a like i'm a child abduction suspect and i'm supposed to give your kid free candy <laughs> fuck yourself dude that <laughs> this is no longer like a transaction that i dude it's sad too because i used to love halloween like when i stopped doing halloween like going out on my own i stopped you know in my probably my mid-teens or whatever i stopped doing it but then I started, like, my mom does a big thing for Halloween every fucking year. And uh, I started doing that. Like, I started helping handing out candy because it was fun for a while. But for too many years, dude, it's been this, like, chaperoned event, which I look back on my childhood. Like, that was one of the nights we were allowed to, like, cut loose. And yeah. we never did anything crazy. We never broke into anybody's houses or did any property damage or anything. But. We weren't suit like it was one of the it was the only night that we were allowed to go out and not be supervised. And it just sucks that because of people's hysteria, this is one little girl on one Halloween night. You know what I mean? Statistically, like there's it's it's like probably like what? How many some 50 million to one? Yeah, it's your like, kid is done. This is done to you probably it's like, a, it's like a needle in 20 haystacks or something. <laughs> and it's just ridiculous that the fucking ho the the holiday has been turned into this like fucking stupid ass school sponsored. They, they do this shit called like some kids don't even get to trick or treat. They do this yeah. shit called trunk or treat, oh, which is yeah. like usually they go to a church and it's all church people. And I'm telling you, dude. Your kids are way more likely to get abducted and molested at one of those fucking church trunk or treats than they are if you just <laughs> cut them loose and let them go fucking trick or treating. So, uh, this, you know what's scarier than any of this stuff, Paul? Racial bigotry. Oh, no. Yeah, we Not got on a Halloween story. We've covered this story before, actually. This is, uh, this is about a guy who was an exchange student. And he went to, unfortunately, they sent him to Louisiana, and he was killed. Damn. So at 8 p.m., a Volvo parked outside the residence of a 30-year-old supermarket butcher named Rodney uh, Piers and his wife, Bonnie Piers. In the vehicle, two teenage boys were trying to figure out if they were at the right address for a Halloween party they were invited to. Decorated in Halloween decorations, the home was in a working-class neighborhood in East Baton Rouge, Louisiana. To the boys, they were on the right road. The house they were looking at was exactly what had been described in the invitation, but was the number on the home the correct one? The boys walked out of their car and into the property of Rodney Piers. The uh, front doorbell rang. They waited, but nobody came out. They began to walk back to their car when suddenly the boys heard the side door leading to the carport open. Mr. Uh, Piers peeped out to see what was. Uh, sorry, Mrs. Pierce. Piers. Uh, she saw one of the boys from a distance. He wore a neck brace due to a recent injury and bandages as part of a Halloween costume. She was about to be uh, questioned by him uh, when the second boy walked around uh, out of the corner and headed to where she was. Frightened, she slammed the door quickly against them. Stunned by her reaction, the boys thought they might have been in the wrong home, so they turned around again and headed to their car. A few feet away from their car, they heard the carport door open. This time, it wasn't the woman from earlier, but a man, a man with a forty-four Magnum revolver. The boy who had frightened Miss Pyrrhus turned back to meet the man. We're here for the party, uh, he said while walking toward him. The man pointed a gun at the boy and yelled, freeze. Before anyone could understand what was going on, the sound of the revolver went off and 16-year-old named uh, Yoshihiro Hattori was on the floor. 
Uh, the light from the Halloween decorations began fading away slowly. Oh, so shit. basically, uh, this 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 uh, Japanese kid who he was here is an exchange student in Louisiana, in Baton Rouge. I mean, that was well, I'm not I, in Louisiana I, anymore, but you know, but it was in I, Louisiana. I gotta tell you. You got to do your research, man. If you're going to be a fucking exchange student to the United States, there are certain fucking areas of the world where it's just inadvisable to go, you know, and Baton Rouge, Louisiana is one of them, dude. Yeah, they're like, all right, uh, you know, uh, Hattori, we're sending you to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It's like, okay, let me just look at that really quick. No, you're not. <laughs> you got anything in uh, California or something? Maybe in yeah. New York? Just look I'm up. Not going, I'm Rouge, not going to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, bro. Baton not Rouge happening. murder statistics or whatever. And just be nope, 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 no. Nope. That's not one for me. <laughs> Let alone that he was like a person of color going to the South, which is always inadvisable as well. Yeah, don't do it. Especially like parts of the South. I mean, I'm sure sure there are better parts and worse parts, but Louisiana overall is one of the yeah, worst. And Baton Rouge, not great. Worse than New Orleans, for sure. All right. Here I am with an egg, Paul. Why oh, is that? shit. Who did you kill on Halloween, TJ? I killed a lot of people on Halloween, Paul. Actually, I'm not, the, I'm not the murderer here. You know who is the murderer? This fucking egg. What? This egg is the killer, Paul. That's why I'm looking at it with such fear. Shit. Yeah, you do look frightened of that egg. The violent legacy of a Halloween prank. Oh, shit. This is called, this is Carl Jackson killed by egg throwers. Damn. One Halloween in the Bronx, teenagers threw eggs at a car. The eggs probably cost the boys a few dollars. They cost Carl Jackson his life. The year was 1998. Mr. Jackson and his girlfriend were picking up her nine-year-old son from a children's party. Mr. Jackson had turned 21 weeks earlier. He was a quiet young man, son of a nurse and a postal worker. He usually avoided going out on Halloween, not because he was too busy. Uh, he was a data entry clerk at Morgan Stanley, but because he thought it was too dangerous. Guess he was right. Because the teenager's eggs struck their car, Mr. Jackson stepped out of the vehicle. An argument began. Mr. Jackson had sat back down in the passenger seat when one of the teenagers just pulled out a gun. A single shot rang out, striking Mr. Jackson in the head, killing him instantly. I think it took us two years to even talk about it, said Gloria Jackson, 62, Mr. Jackson's mother. We were just devastated. We never thought that anyone from our family would be murdered, especially on a holiday for something stupid. Halloween eggings have uh, left a, have a violent a uh, legacy in New York City. Since 1984, at least 24 people have been seriously wounded or killed in stabbing, shooting, beating accidents sparked by egg-throwing confrontations around Halloween. All 24 cases played out in roughly the same way. A group of boys hurled eggs at pedestrians, cars, or houses. The targets confronted the throwers, and violence erupted. Most of the 24 victims were teenagers or young men. The New York Police Department said it did not compile statistics on eggings. The tally of 24 victims comes from a review of articles in the New York Times, the Daily News, the New York Post, and Newsday. Dude, I believe, I believe this episodes. shit, dude. I was involved in an incident that could have could have went this way. Oh, shit. I was on the other end of it. I, I would have been the killer. Cool. Like, I I was uh, visiting my, my parents... I was back in uh, my little hometown. I was living in Arizona and I'd driven down there with my uh, girlfriend at the time. And we were out late, you know, hanging out with my friends and shit. We had a few drinks. She was driving because I was, you know, pretty liquored up. And we were staying at my mom's house in my old bedroom, just, you know, a spare, it's now a spare bedroom or it was at the time. Um, and we pulled up into my mom's neighborhood and there was just toilet paper like hanging from every tree like a bunch and then it became clear that the people like we'd we'd run up on them while they were doing it we saw them scatter and my girlfriend at the time she didn't even think she just gunned it at one of them that was running down the street she just picked one of them it was like this is the motherfucker we're gonna catch and she forced gumped him basically like she ran her car like right up behind him 
to the okay. and, and like all you know you know how that is like real close like like that Forrest Gump scene then he jumped into the back seat of a car and tried to like hide and I pounded on the window of the car drunk as a skunk I don't know what it was like when I turned around and I saw my mom's house with TP all over it I was enraged dude I don't know what it was <laughs> <laughs> even though I was a kid that had done this countless times to other people's yards as an adult I was just like fuck this. <laughs> so I pounded on that dude's door and I was like, I'm gonna beat your fucking ass, man. You're gonna get out. You're calling your fucking parents, man. You're gonna fucking come right back here tomorrow and you can clean up every bit of this fucking TP. You can call your little friends that were involved. You can get them to come down here. But finally, the guy just like had no choice. He got out of the car. And uh, I, I literally I took him to my mom's house. I woke my fucking parents up. I was like, this little motherfucker right here and three of his buddies. Thought it was cute to TP your whole lawn, so they're gonna come and clean it up tomorrow. And then his his friends eventually like came by because they were worried about him. <laughs> <laughs> and so they I, they, I literally made them stand there and call their parents oh, at like man. three in the morning and tell them <laughs> like I'm over at you know my so and so's house. <laughs> I TP'd it, and I gotta come back tomorrow and clean it up. Can you come pick me up? <laughs> uh, it was. Crazy. That, that was probably the most narc shit that I ever did in my life. But <laughs> dude, I was. But it was in defense of your mom's house, you know. You gotta yeah, be like, dude, yeah, you can't fuck with my mama's with house. I would. I've, I've very rarely in my life been that mad. I just was like, just saw red, murderous <laughs> red. Like fuck you. Leave my mom's house alone, place. you son of a bitch, dude. Only that one time. <laughs> Only that one time was I the fun police because it like the fun was at my mom's expense. And nah, dude, nah. Uh -uh. You don't mess with Paul's mama, dude. That's yeah, dude, don't mess with rule. my fucking mama, dude. No, no, no. And look, dude, I never got caught. In defense of me being a hypocrite because I did it when I was a fucking teenager and shit, I was, I was smart enough to never get run up on by you know, my victim's angry, drunk son in the middle of the night. You want to know <laughs> a, a great piece of trivia about this? What? My sister ended up marrying one of those TP throwing motherfuckers. <laughs> That's classic. <laughs> Can uh, you fucking believe that shit? God damn it, man. Oh, what an awkward fucking. Yeah. I know. It's, it's, I can hold it over him forever though. You know, it's like having a brother-in-law that you have the ultimate thing that you could the ultimate card you can pull at any time. Yeah, it's like, hey, remember that time I fucking made you call your mom and <laughs> to come pick you up and shit. He's like the he pastor fucking... of a church and I could like verbally pants him at any time. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I love it. I love I it. I fucking love it, dude. <laughs> well, that's all the Halloween mayhem I have for you. Um, you know, maybe it wasn't Halloween themed enough, but uh, you know, it all happened on Halloween, you know? It all fuck maybe it didn't maybe it doesn't follow the the formula of the trope, but I mean, this is you know, Paul, you're 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 my episodes were kind of almost like inversions of each other. Yours was like the real life events that inspired movies and mine is just like the real life events that um are uh, maybe didn't inspire the movies, but are kind of like uh, a deconstruction of like the Halloween mythos. Cause like the real Halloween murders way more uh, grounded, way more human, usually way more, um, I don't know, stupid, pointless, meaningless, just, you know, like, yep. You know, some poor kid snatched up by like a fucking crazed pervert or some dumbass dad in fucking a hundred thousand dollars debt giving his kids a fucking poison pixie stick or some crazy fucked up bullshit like that. But we never did get the the ritual Satan murder or whatever. And just think of how how like many times people that are in those positions, like being Satanists or Wiccans or whatever the fuck have been vilified in the media. Yeah, and where is that? You know, yeah, but you never see them. There's never a witch coven that pulls any of this. It's always just like a Christian pastor or whatever that decided he wanted to rape a dead and body. And yeah, and then they act like they, you know, all they act like these satanic cults are out there doing all this evil shit. And uh, where where is it? You know, you find you find all kinds of like crazy pastor does this, religious nut does that, but the Satanists are pretty fucking law abiding. They don't fucking they're not out there killing your kids and shit. It's these goddamn Christians. You gotta watch out for. Just saying. 
So uh, here in about 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes, something like that, TJ yep. and I are going to be going live for our patrons only with another episode of the Grease Trap. Going to have uh, a little conversation over there. I pulled a mixed only. bag of a, a new uh, thing that I'm going to do on the Grease Trap called uh, News of No Consequence. Cool. Cool. So Just we're going to take a list meaningless news stories, yeah. I guess <laughs> news that doesn't matter in any way, shape or form. And is completely and utterly meaningless. Sounds good to me. See y'all there. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks for everybody who watched. Thanks, especially to the people who donated and thanks, especially, especially to our patrons who we will see on the other end of the paywall. Happy Halloween. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Peace. See you on the other side. <laughs>